Starship launched for the third time last week, made it to space, but then burned up on re-entry. NASA's SpaceX Crew-7 successfully returned to Earth, a brand new Japanese rocket exploded seconds into its maiden flight, Electron launched the last of three dedicated launches for the Strix constellation, a Long March 2C suffered a partial failure when attempting to deliver two satellites to lunar orbit, and SpaceX's Starlink constellation grew by another 23 satellites. All of this and so much more to cover in today's episode of Space This Week, let us begin. Yeah, so there's really not any point skirting around the biggest event of the past week, right? That's right, we saw the orbital launch attempt of a Long March 2C, which carried two payloads. Okay, okay, I, I joke, obviously. It was, of course, Starship Flight 3, the third ever launch of the world's biggest and most powerful rocket. As the clock counted down, I was a bit worried we might have another SN11 on our hands again, as the launch area was completely shrouded in fog. But as we got close to T-0, things had thankfully started to clear up. And then, it finally happened. We had engine ignition and then liftoff, and I think for many people, our eyes immediately jumped to the Raptor engine diagram on the stream UI to check that yes, all 33 Raptors were lit. And they were. <laughs> and then we got something a little unexpected. On-flight views. Something that was absent from the Flight 2 stream. I love seeing how quickly this thing screamed through the cloud layer, watching them vanish below, and then we got an uninterrupted on-board view of the hot stage event, wherein the six raptors of the upper stage lit while still attached to Super Heavy Booster 10 before the two separated. Now at this point we were wondering if Booster 10 would terminate in a similar manner to Booster 9, but no, it seemed to successfully steer itself down towards the Gulf of Mexico with those huge grid fins. Though towards the end it did start rolling back and forth quite aggressively, and the Raptor engines ultimately failed to reignite, resulting in the booster slamming into the ocean at about 1 km per second. So, uh, probably not gonna buff out that, to be honest. <laughs> anyway, onto the Starship. It then made it to space on a suborbital trajectory. The plan was never to actually make it to full orbit for safety reasons, but SpaceX were planning on relighting a Raptor engine while in space in order to enter a trans-atmospheric trajectory, but unfortunately the planned Raptor restart was cancelled. That wasn't the only test that SpaceX wanted to run in space though, the other two tests were reportedly a success. A propellant transfer test was started and run to completion, and the payload bay door was opened and closed too, although the latter looks like it might need some more work. It really looked like the door struggled to open fully, and I'm not too sure if it ever managed to successfully close at the end of the test, though admittedly the camera angle makes it a little bit hard to tell. Then it was time for re-entry. I don't think any of us expected the views here to be so spectacular. Seeing those plumes of plasma erupting around the heat shield was insane. Speaking of the heat shield, it looks like Ship 28 retained a lot more of its tiles than Ship 24 and 25, though some still did fall off as you can see. That wasn't really the biggest problem that the ship was facing at this stage though. It was in a massive roll during re-entry. It is a bit hard to tell from the raw video, but Twitter user Ofello uploaded a stabilised video that does a really, really good job at showing just how extreme the roll was. I'm going to put a link to the post in the video description so you can watch the full thing yourself. I also have to say the same about a video from Pocken CG, showing a 3D representation of the ship's orientation during re-entry, giving an idea of how and why the ship was eventually lost. Yep, I mean, you guys already knew this by now, but the ship did not survive re-entry. Communications was lost at around 65 kilometers altitude. The hypersonic re-entry environment is a brutal one, Mach 25, so to be honest, I would have been more surprised if this worked the first time. I think Starship re-entry is definitely going to be one of, if not the, biggest hurdles that SpaceX will need to overcome. Now where was I during the launch? Well I was here. <laughs> yeah sadly I missed the beginning of the launch because I'd finished my shift at work and was frantically cycling home through the wind and rain as fast as possible but sadly I missed it by literally only about a minute. Thankfully you can rewind live streams. <laughs> Don't know why I'm mentioning this to be honest but just thought it might be a you know, fun anecdote about my life <laughs> and also the reason I wasn't streaming the launch which you know some people asked why I didn't slash wasn't and that's why. Hopefully I'll be able to do it for Flight 4 but We'll have to wait and see. 
Flight 4, though, is hopefully not too far away. Certainly, hopefully, a lot closer to us than the amount of time we had to wait between Flight 2 and 3. Because by all accounts, Flight 3 was much more successful than Flight 2. We, of course, got much closer to safe splashdown of the booster. It didn't just explode like it did in Flight 2. And we, of course, saw that amazing re-entry footage of Ship 28. The next launch date is, of course, very dependent on whether or not SpaceX can address the problems faced by Flight 3, namely that out-of-control spinning of the ship on re-entry, as well as a few other things like, you know, maybe adding some more grease to that door mechanism. <laughs> ship 29 has already completed a six-engine spin prime test, so just needs to complete a static fire before it's good to go, and Super Heavy Booster 11 is on engine installation stand 2 in Mega Bay 1, awaiting its rollout to the launch pad for spin prime and static fire testing before it's ready too. In fact, Booster 12 and Ship 30 are also coming along really quickly too, with the booster receiving its engines on engine installation stand 1, and the ship awaiting its engine install at the production site. Now, crucially, did Stage 0 survive? Well, for the most part, yes. NASA spaceflight was soon at the scene and captured some great views of the Flight 3 aftermath, as well as this amazing video of the launch. Seriously, I'm going to link the full video in the description because this is definitely something you'll want to watch in full with the sound on. <laughs> the orbital launch mount looks intact though, but it will need another coat of paint to get it back to how it was pre-launch, but otherwise everything looks good. Though it's a bit early to be conclusive, but you know, there's no sign of you know, manifestly obvious damage, aside from a few cosmetic imperfections here and there. While Starship may have burned up upon re-entry, luckily the same can't be said for Crew Dragon Endurance, which safely returned the four members of NASA's SpaceX Crew 7 mission from the International Space Station last week. On Monday, NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbili, ESA astronaut Andreas Mogensen, JAXA astronaut Satoshi Furukawa, and Roscosmos cosmonaut Konstantin Borisov all made their way on board the spacecraft before the hatch was closed behind them. About two and a bit hours later, the Crew Dragon autonomously undocked from the space station's Harmony module, departing the station after being docked there for 197 days, two hours and four minutes. Not too long after this, a deorbit burn was made and the spacecraft made a successful atmospheric re-entry, followed by parachute deployment and splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Florida, bringing a successful close to SpaceX's seventh operational mission for NASA's commercial crew program. Recovery ships were soon at the scene, and the crew successfully disembarked the capsule roughly 20 hours after boarding. In addition to another masterful commercial crew mission, SpaceX also completed another Falcon 9 launch. On Saturday, the rocket blasted off from Launch Complex 39A at Cape Canaveral, carrying 23 Starlink V2 minis to Shell 6. As always, stage separation was quickly followed by the first stage performing a boost back and landing burn, coming down to rest on the shortfall of Gravitas drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. It's nearly the big 2-0 for this first stage, B1062, as this was its 19th mission overall. Crazy numbers, really. <laughs> Rocket Lab had a successful 45th Electron launch last week. On Tuesday, they launched their Owl Night Long mission from Mahia, New Zealand. On board, the Electron was the Strix 3 Earth Observation Satellite, and this was Rocket Lab's third and final of three dedicated launches for Synspective's Strix Constellation. The Strix Constellation was developed through Japan's Impact Program and is a pioneering effort in synthetic aperture radar technology, providing high-res Earth imagery at a fraction of the cost of conventional satellites, and Synspective ultimately want the constellation to consist of 30 satellites by the late 2020s. For this particular Electron launch, no first stage recovery attempt was made. Starship was kind of a success, kind of a failure, as was China Aerospace Science Technology Corporation's Long March 2C launch last week. The vehicle lifted off on Wednesday from the Zichang launch complex, carrying the distant retrograde orbit A and B technology demonstration satellites to lunar orbit. However, the rocket suffered an anomaly with its YZ-1S upper stage, which meant that it didn't reach lunar orbit, instead only being able to place the satellites into low Earth orbit. In view of the partial failure, I found it really hard to find footage of this launch, so apologies for the vertical video I had to use, and if it got copyright claimed, that's why the screen is all blurry now, but hey, you know, let's, let's plan for success. Partial launch failures aside, we also had a total launch failure last week as well. 
The same day as Long March 2C, we saw the maiden flight of the Kairos rocket, a Japanese solid fuel rocket designed to be able to place small sats weighing up to a quarter metric ton to low Earth orbit, built by the private Japanese company Space One. For its first flight, it carried the rapid launch small satellite payload, but unfortunately, the rocket exploded pretty much immediately after liftoff, with automatic flight termination system activating at T plus five seconds. This uh, energetic end to the mission did result in fires and damage to the launch area. Hopefully Space One can figure out what went wrong here and we can see another launch attempt of this vehicle in the not too distant future. I guess this is another good reminder that space can sometimes be hard. Unless you allow an aerospace! <laughs> yes, last week I launched the seventh episode of my beginner's playthrough of KSP2's exploration mode, heading to Duna for the very first time. I go through each step nice and carefully to hopefully help you perform your very first Duna landing and return if you've not managed it before. But other than that, that's everything I had to cover this week. I hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you want to support me further, then I do have a Patreon you can join, just like these great people on the left did. And, you know, there are two videos on screen that hopefully look like they're interesting for you to watch next. And, uh, and that's it. Thank you for watching once again. Uh, bye. Bye, bye. Bye, bye, bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Oh, leave a like on the video as well. I forgot to say that.